All right, we're ready for Isaiah 45 to 48. In our study of the book of Isaiah, we're in the second major section of the book, and we are in the first subsection, and that is deliverance from Babylon. The two major section has to do with the judgment from God, the Assyrian period, and then we have comfort from God, hope for troublesome times, the remnant returns. And this deals more with the Babylonian period, uh, yet in the future, not at the present, but in the future from the time of Isaiah. But chapters 40 to 48 deals with deliverance from Babylonian captivity. There are three things that happen in, in this second half of the book. By second half, I'm talking about the second half as far as outline. And that is the deliverance from Babylonian captivity. We'll talk about the Messiah, the suffering servant, and then future glory. So we're looking at the second half of this deliverance from Babylonian captivity. Uh, at the time that Isaiah is prophesying, I've said this multiple times and I want to remind you again, that while Isaiah is prophesying at the time, Assyria is in power. Babylon has yet, yet to rise to the level of becoming a world empire. And so the prophecy is you're going to see Babylon rise to the, be the world empire and then they're going to carry you into Babylonian captivity, speaking to the southern kingdom. And then the Babylonian kingdom is going to fall at the hand of the Medo-Persian empire. And so we're talking about three different empires. And so <clears throat> what we're seeing in our study tonight, this section continues that point, the point of deliverance from Babylonian captivity. That's what we started with last time. So this is what we saw in 40 to 44. So from 40 to 48 is the section about deliverance from Babylonian captivity. So what we saw last time is, we called it simply deliverance from Babylonian captivity. Tonight it's deliverance from Babylonian captivity. But in chapter 40, we saw a look at the greatness of God to comfort the people. The great and the mighty God that we serve. We saw several things about that. Then chapter 41 was a challenge that God can foretell the future. We talked about this last time. We're going to talk about it a couple of times tonight. God can foretell the future, but can the gods of the nations? <clears throat> And so you might take note of that passage in, uh, in chapter 41, if you haven't already, that that deals with evidence that, the, that prophecy and fulfillment is a evidence the, of the Bible being inspired and that God is true. We're going to see that again tonight a couple of times. And so watch for that. One of your questions is to, to watch for that and see where we, how many times we have that. Then 42 and 43 was the making the point that God will take care of his people and then 44, Israel should not fear because the one true God promises to deliver. So while God had been telling them, Assyria is not going to take you, they need to trust God in that. But they also need to understand Babylon will take you. But Babylon is not going to make another end of you. There will be a remnant to come back and you will return. So if God fulfills his promise concerning Assyria, and they're going to see that, they ought to be assured he's going to fulfill his promise concerning Babylon of it coming and the coming also of Cyrus that we'll talk about here in just a moment. So here's what we see tonight. Four chapters, four points. Chapter 45, the instrument and the effect of Israel's deliverance. That is Cyrus, the, the, the Mede. That is the Persian Empire. So as the Medo-Persians merge together, the Medes and the Persians merge to make the Medo-Persian Empire, that Cyrus the leader is the one who's going to to uh, cause them to return. We'll say more about that here in just a second. Chapter 46, we see God contrasted the Babylonian idols. And then in chapter 47, Babylon will be brought down. And so you say, well, I understand that. And I know Babylon's going to be brought down. What, why do we need to keep seeing that? Judah needs to see that because as they see Babylon rise in power, the worldwide empire who thinks they're the mighty, they will never fall and they see that Babylon takes them into captivity, they may think they're never coming back. God has power over the Babylonian gods. And then chapter 48 is simply Israel's need for deliverance was brought upon herself. But in spite of that, God's going to bring them out of captivity and there will be a remnant. So let's start here in chapter 45. So here are the things you need to watch for in our study tonight. Watch for the, the fact that a nation and its leader is a tool or an instrument in the hand of God. We've seen that repeatedly thus far in Isaiah. And I don't apologize for driving that home again. Hopefully, three years from now, and we not, don't have maybe the prophets on our mind, something may be going on that you'll remember God uses nations and leaders as tools 
And you say, oh yeah, I remember that from Isaiah. I remember that from Jeremiah. I remember that from Ezekiel. I remember that from Daniel. That God uses nations and leaders as tools and instruments to accomplish his purpose. And we're going to see that in this chapter. You might take note of the fact, if you were not here last time, back up into chapter 44, and you might underline the word, the name Cyrus. He's mentioned by name, chapter 44 and in verse 28, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. In other words, Cyrus will be the one to bring Babylon down and release the people and let them come back into the land. So Cyrus is the one that's going to do that. Now he's mentioned again in chapter 45 in verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Might underline that Cyrus is mentioned again by name. So what we're going to see here is that God used Cyrus as an instrument, and Cyrus is that instrument that God's going to use. So let's work our way through this, and then we'll stop and talk about Cyrus just a little bit before we go to the God's deliverance will cause the Gentiles to turn. God's going to use Cyrus to open up the way. So we're going to hit the high points. We don't have time for every point. Notice he's referred to as God's anointed. Not that he's a person of God, not that he's the faithful of God, but it reminds me of Romans 13 of how uh, they are, uh, the, the civil government is, is appointed of God and they are the servant of God in that sense. And so he's a servant of God in that sense. Whose right hand I have held. In other words, God holds Cyrus' right hand and, and Cyrus is the tool and that's all he is, is an instrument doing whatever God wants him to do. He'll subdue nations. Uh, God will open the door for him. Look at verse, uh, yeah, that's found in verse one. So that the gates will not be shut. I will go before him and make the crooked places straight and break down the, the pieces of the gates. In other words, God's going to make the path clear for Cyrus to do whatever God wants him to do. Not literally opening the gates, but it's, if, if there's something that looks impossible, God's going to open the gate for him. Uh, if a hill looks too steep to climb, God's going to take that hill down for him. God's going to lead the way for Cyrus, verses 1 through 3. Now, beginning at verse 4, or verse 4 alone, God does this for the sake of his people. So God's not merely interested in Babylon and the Persians. He's doing all of this in view of his people. Look at verse 4. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. In other words, it's for the sake of my people that I'm giving them deliverance and allowing them to return. That's what this is all about. It's not merely trying to punish Babylon. I'm trying to bring my people back into the land as I have promised. Now, beginning at verse 3, we're backing up just a little bit. It's going to be known there is no other God. When God brings Babylon down and Cyrus lets the people go back, then there's evidence that God is all-powerful and there is no other God. Look at the end of verse 3. That you may know that I, the Lord, who called you by my name, am the God of Israel. Drop down to verse 5. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God beside me. Uh, that they may know from the rising of the sun, I'm at verse 6, uh, that there is none beside me. In other words, here is a point that had Judah taken note of that and fully understood it, they never would have gone into captivity in the first place. Had they understood there is no other God other than the God of heaven and respected that, there would be no concern about Babylonian captivity. But now they're dealing with Babylonian captivity or going to because they didn't understand that very point. But when God does what he does, it's going to be known God has the power to do that. Now verses 9 to 13, God's way should not be questioned. Now there's two... Two points about that. Notice in verses 9 and 10. The warning is issued to one who would question his maker. Look at verse 9. Woe to him who strives with his maker. In other words, the one who questions God. How could you do this? Or how could this be? Or how, how can I be assured of this? And he says, uh, let the potsherd strive with the, the potsherd of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that forms it, Why are you, uh, what are you making? And that you're looking for this on your handout. There are two illustrations. There are the warning about questioning God. There's two comparisons. The first is the clay questioning the potter. In other words, can you imagine if you could personify the, the clay that's put up on the potter's wheel and it speaks up and says to the potter, what are you making? And why are you making me like this? Who is the pottery to question the potter? And the second illustration is, at verse 10, Woe to him who says to the father, why are you begetting? In other words, of the child saying, why did you beget me? Or why, why did you give birth to me? Why, why did you do that? That's the second comparison. 
Now, that's not an exact quotation over in Romans 9, but Romans 9 basically quotes from or alludes to that same principle to those that would question God's dealing with the Jews and the Gentiles, of God rejecting the Jews and accepting the Gentiles. And verse 21, why does the potter have power over the clay? And um, verse 20, that the one who formed, why would he say, why have you made me like this? That seems to be alluding, though it's not a direct quotation, to this passage in Isaiah 45. Um, but be that as it may, the warning is issued, who are we to question God? So verses 11 to 13, God is the creator. Let's get that point. God is the creator. And he says, thus says, I'm reading at verse 11, the Holy One and his maker uh, ask me of the things concerning my sons, concerning the work of my hands that you commanded me. I've made the earth and created man in it. It is, it is I. In other words, I am the creator of all things. Who are you to question me? So now look at verse 13. I have raised him. Him is Cyrus. I have, and I think that because of verse, verse 1. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all of his ways. It doesn't mean that Cyrus is righteous, but justice means that he's going to raise Cyrus up to do the things that Cyrus needs to do. And he shall build my city and let my exiles go free. Well, who did that? Well, Cyrus did. Not for a price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. He's not doing it because he gets a reward. He's doing it because I'm telling him to do it and I'm, uh, he's, he's my tool, he's my instrument. That's what I see down through verse 13. So Cyrus is the instrument that God is going to use. Now what's interesting about this is that Cyrus, this is being prophesied somewhere around 720. Uh, Isaiah was about from 740 to 700. So let's say 720 of this being prophesied. Cyrus was not born until 599 B.C. So we're talking his birth, not his action, but his birth is at least 120 years away. And God's prophesying and saying, Cyrus, not that there's going to be a leader, and I think it's going to come from the east or from the north, but Cyrus, by name, is the man that's going to do that. He's going to let my people go from Babylonian captivity, and Babylon hasn't rose in power yet. And you think of the double prophecy of that, in the sense of the double whammy of, of the effect of that prophecy. Now, just for what it may be worth to us, uh, Cyrus, uh, according to Josephus and his antiquities, says that Cyrus was reading from Isaiah the prophet. You're looking for this in your handout. That he was reading from Isaiah 44 and 45. That's where we are. And came across his own name. And because of that, he decided to let the people go. Well, in archaeology, there has been the discovery in 1879, there was the discovery of this little nine-inch cylinder. This is Cyrus's cylinder that's about four and a half inches across and about nine inches long, something like that. And it tells of Cyrus overtaking Babylon in 539 B.C. and he's allowing the captives to return on a humanitarian approach. And it says on the cylinder in the... Uh, translation of that I am Cyrus king of all the great uh, uh, king of all the great king the mighty king king of Babylon king of Sumer king of Akkad king of the four corners of the earth well compare that with Ezra chapter 1 and it basically says the same kind of thing that he was the one that let the people go same thing found in 2nd Chronicles 36 in verse 23 um, in other words archaeology confirms Cyrus was the one he claimed to be the one and uh, and um, Josephus says he was the one that let the people go um, for what that may be uh, worth to us. So anyway, it's interesting to me to take note of the fact that he was reading from this very section as to why he decided I need to be the one to let him go. And he did. Now let's move to verses 14 through 25. Which, by the way, uh, there, that's one of the evidences we could cite. And you're looking for this in your handout. Um, on the bottom of the first page passages in 45 uh, to 48 that point to fulfillment of prophecy as evidence of God. That would be one right there. That it was prophesied about 120 years before he was even born that he would be the leader. And we're going to say more about that prophecy a little bit later. Uh, but that would be one of at least three sections we're going to see in, that, in answer to that question. Let's go to 14 to 25. Israel's deliverance will cause the Gentiles to turn to God. 
Turn to God in the sense, turn to Israel and respect the fact that their God must be powerful. Now, what's going to cause that? Well, it's when Babylon re- is defeated and the remnant returns. And when they come back into the land, then they're going to be impressed with that. Now, <clears throat> there are three nations, verse 14, that come to Israel. There are three nations that come to Israel. They're mentioned at verse, and you're looking for these three on your handout. There's Egypt. There's Cush, which is Ethiopia, and there is the Sabaeans, who were uh, in the upper Egypt region. And in what sense are they going to come? Well, they're going to come and they're going to say at verse 14, the end of verse 14, surely God is with you and there is no other, there is no other God. Well, that's what God had already said they would do. Uh, That's going to be the effect. They're going to know that there's no other God back at verses 3 to 8. Well, the nations are going to come and they're going to want to join up with Israel and join an alliance with Israel, be in in good standing with Israel because they recognize there is no other God other than your God. Now, verses 15 to 19, and this gets interesting to me, verse 15, a little controversy uh, or disagreement more than a controversy as to what verse 15 means. And we'll get to that in just a second. But Israel is going to be delivered with everlasting salvation. That's mentioned at verse 17. But when we get to verse 15, here's the the question. Truly you are God who hide yourself. In what sense does God hide himself? I take it that he hides himself in the sense that his ways are beyond man. That God's ways are beyond man. Um, I might, if God put me in charge, I might have done it different than Babylon rising up taking Assyria and Cyrus being the one to take Babylon down, but I would have messed it all up. But God's ways are are higher than my ways, like Isaiah 55. Pulpit says that's all wrong. Pulpit suggests that God has hid his ways and his powers from the world and not manifested in the sense that he is now under the leadership of Cyrus delivering his people. I'm not sure that that's a whole lot of difference. And if you said I got confused, I didn't see a distinction there. Well, neither did I see a big one. But uh, pulpit does make a distinction in that. But I think he's saying God's ways are are higher than ours is is the point that's being made. Now, when God delivers Israel, look at verse 16. They they shall be ashamed. That is, the nations are going to be ashamed that they put their trust in their gods and their idols. But God will deliver Israel with an everlasting salvation. I don't think that's necessarily messianic there. It may be. And if it is, if you think it is, then go ahead and mark it as messianic. I think it's just showing that... uh, God's going to deliver them uh, in the sense of uh, that he's going to, with a, with a strong right hand and a strong right arm, God's going to bring them out of, uh, out of Babylonian captivity. Uh, now, let's drop down to verse 20 to 25 in interest of time. Uh, that the Gentiles will see there's no other God. Now, we've already uh, hinted at that up here. At verse 14, we saw a, a direct statement about that in 3 to 8. Now we're going to see it again in 20 to 25. There's going to see from this deliverance of the return of the captives, they're going to see that. Now notice God makes fun and ridicules the fact of the, the idols being uh, worthless. He said, assemble together, verse 20, uh, you've escaped from the nations. There is no knowledge who carry the wood to their carved image. And they pray to a God that cannot save, and tell it to bring forth. And so, tell and bring forth your case, um, and take counsel together. In other words, uh, God said, uh, "What you do with idols, you, you get your wood together, and you make your your God, and then you fix it in place. And your God's worthless. Your God is powerless. Those idols are powerless. But have I the Lord? Have if not I the Lord? There is no other God beside me." And a just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Then go further. Look, look now uh, at me and be saved, you ends of the earth, for I am the Lord and there is no other. Now, interesting verse 23. And you're looking for this in your outline. That every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take oath. Now that's quoted in Romans 14 and verse 11. And here's what we learn from that. When quoted in the New Testament, every nation and every knee is going to come to recognize God is the only God and there is no other. But for many, when they recognize that, it's going to be too late. That's the point. 
So all of the nations are going to come to recognize the Gentiles ultimately going to see there is no other God. But it may be too late when they finally come to recognize that. But I will display my power and I'm going to display who I am and that I am the mighty God. And the Gentiles are going to take note of that. Now, you're looking for this on the back of your handout. Verse 25. I'm convinced it's probably messianic. If you think not, then don't mark it as such. That the Lord... In the Lord, all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall, um, shall be justified and shall glory. That that's probably messianic, that's ultimately accomplished in spiritual Israel. Uh, I've marked it as a messianic section. And you say, I don't think so, then, then don't mark that and we'll be good. All right, there's plenty of other messianic sections if you think that one's not. All right, so here's what happened in chapter 45. I want to move on. And that is the instrument and the effect of Israel's deliverance is Cyrus, and then that has an impact upon the Gentiles. They're going to take note of that, and they're going to see that and recognize the power of the one true God. All right, let's go further to chapter 46. Only two things here, short chapter. So let's see if we can work through this one rather quickly. 13 verses, here is God contrasted to the Babylonian idols. Now there's two contrasts actually we're looking for here. The first one is a God who carries man in contrast to a man who carries his God. Now, this is, this is almost comical if it were not so uh, serious. There are two Babylonian gods that are mentioned here, uh, Baal and Nebo. They are told uh, Baal bows down and Nebo stoops. I think it talks about, is alluding to their weakness. It's not that the, these idol gods actually are working and so one can bow down and that suggests he's alive. No, that's not the point. The point is, it's as if they're stooping and bowing down out of weakness. They're weak gods. Uh, there is no strength to their gods. We, don't, we won't read every verse, but, uh, or every word of every verse, but notice the scan through verses 1 to 7. I'm starting verse 1. Their idols were on their beast, and their carriages uh, were heavily burdened. Uh, they stoop and they bow down together. Uh, drop down with me um, in verse 3. Listen, O house of Israel, remnant of the house of Israel, who uh, have been upheld by me. Now, God immediately makes a contrast. You are the ones carrying your gods. You, you take your gods and put them on your animal, and you carry them and transport them from place to place. So here's man carrying his god. In contrast, verse 3 and 4, I carried you from birth and have carried you from the womb. Even to your old age, I have carried you. So I was carrying you, but you carried your gods. What a contrast. What a contrast. Now at verse 7, they bear it on their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in place and it stands from, uh, from its place. It shall not be moved. The one cry out, it cannot answer so the, the idea, you're carrying your God around and you set your God down and then you pray to it and it doesn't do anything. And you cry for help and it couldn't, can't give you any help. Worthless gods. Now beginning at verse 8, after seeing that contrast, uh, what we're going to see here is the second contrast you're looking for in your handout. A God who foretells the future to the gods that cannot foretell the future. So here's how you can tell if it's a, the one true living God. Can he foretell the future? So we're, we're looking at the bottom of page one, some sections that have to do with prophecy and, and fulfillment as evidence. Here's a second of those right here in this, uh, this section. And we're at, right here in uh, yeah, verse eight. Remember this and show yourselves men. Recall to mine, O transgressors. Remember, here's the point. The former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none, declaring the end from the beginning. You see, I foretold and I prophesied like 120 years before Cyrus was ever born, he'd be the one. But that wasn't the only thing. There were prophecies before that and prophecies before that and prophecies before that and prophecies before that. So God made prophecies and they were fulfilled. And when they're fulfilled, that proves he's God. Now these gods can't do that. They can't do that. And from ancient times, things that were yet to be done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do my pleasure, calling a prey of bird from the east. Who's the prey of bird? Well, that's Cyrus. And he was from the north and from the east. And you say, well, I'm a little confused. I don't have time to go into that. Go back, if you have the workbook, go back to the previous lesson. 
uh, and look at the footnote in, in the previous lesson about harmonizing the north and the east in chapter 41 and verse 25. So 41 and 25, and, and then 46 in verse 11, he was from the north and from the east. Um, so that's Cyrus. God said, I'm going to use him. And so I'm going to do what I promise. I foretold and prophesied. Your gods can't do that, but I can, and I'm going to fulfill that. Now look at verse 12. Listen, you stubborn-hearted who are far from righteousness. I will bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far. My salvation will not linger. Uh, in other words, I'm going to do what I promised. So what's the point of chapter 46? God in contrast to the Babylonian God. Babylon's going to rise in power, but their God's not going to stop a thing. They carry their gods, but I carried you is what God's saying. And I'm going to do what I say. And uh, evidence that I'm the one true God, I've prophesied things of old. And so I'm learning and I'm being more, this is one of the most impressive things to me from the book of Isaiah. I'm seeing this more than I've ever seen it before. The point of prophecy and fulfillment being strong evidence. I've always known that, but I've never caught how many times Isaiah mentioned that. Um, I've put it in the workbook, so I must have caught it, but I didn't remember it. So it, this has impressed me again more the prophecy and fulfillment and we're not through even in this study tonight we got more to come all right let's go to chapter 47 now um, we got two chapters to go and i think we're going to make it that babylon will be brought down now uh, just as a footnote we, we may think well we've seen this before god's going to bring them down i got that this is a prophecy of doom god's going to bring them down and i got that let's get on to something else well, if God had said it 20 times before, and he says it the 21st time, then I'm going to read it the 21st time because he must have thought I needed to see it. Uh, or thought the readers of the text needed to see that again. And so let's go over that again, even though we know God's going to bring them down. Now, here's a note you're looking for in your handout, and you probably want to put this in the margin of your Bible. This prophecy was a, this is approximate time. This is not 150 versus 152 or 149. But this is approximately 150 years beforehand. Now here again is some, some idea of prophecy and fulfillment. Um, and that is, a hundred and, it's not like Babylon is, 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 looks like it's, it's going to teeter and fall. And, it, and I see Cyrus rising in power. I believe Cyrus is going to be the one to bring him down. Well, that didn't take a Solomon to figure that one out. Um, but 150 years before, 150 years before. Make a note of that. That's, that's powerful to me. Um, here's some description of Babylon. Babylon is going to be brought to shame, verses 1 to 3. Babylon is going to be brought to shame. Um, Babylon is addressed as the virgin daughter, perhaps um, because she's never been defiled, uh, but she's about to be defiled, uh, according to verse 1. Come down and sit under the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, and sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Uh, you thought of yourself as a virgin. You thought of yourself as undefiled. Uh, you're about to be defiled. You're going to be defiled. Now, the prophecy has been made, again, 150 years before. Babylon hasn't even come to power yet. Uh, now, we're watching for this in our handout, uh, in the midsection of um, this, uh, of your handout. Look at verse 2. Here are some des descriptions of the shame brought upon Babylon. And the first is, take the millstone and grind the mill. In other words, you're going to become a servant of another and you're going to grind mill. In other words, you thought yourself to be this this powerful nation, I'm going to turn you into servant grinding for someone else. In other words, the Medo-Persians are going to take you over and you're going to be servants of them. Remove your veil. So God's going to remove her veil. God's going to take off her skirt and uncover the thigh and pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. So the five things you're looking for in the handout is you're going to be a servant of another and grind a meal, and grind meal. Remove her veil. The veil was to, to cover and a sign of humility and a sign of submission. God's going to rip that off. I'm going to take your veil off. And you're going to be revealed for who you are. The third thing was take off her skirt. 
and uncover her thigh. And number five is her nakedness shall be uncovered. Now let's footnote. If you have the workbook, you have this footnote there, and you've heard this many times, but putting this in the context. This is not talking about us. This is not talking about literally God's going to do this, but he, he personifies a nation as a woman. And what he says, though, is that if I lift your skirt off, I'm going to embarrass you. If I expose your nakedness, that is embarrassing you. I'm going to bring you to shame. The phrase I want you to look at is that I'm going to, um, let me find the phrase here, uncover your thigh. To expose the thigh was a sense of shame and equated with nakedness. That's what I want you to see. And that point needs to be made in talking about modesty. I'm not going to drive that point home right now, but I just, I'm putting this in the context that what God is saying, I'm picturing Babylon as a woman and I'm going to show her thighs to the world, and she ought to be ashamed. And I'm going to take her skirt off, and she ought to be ashamed. I'm going to expose her nakedness, and she'll be ashamed. I'm going to take her, rip her veil off. She's going to be defiled. I'm bringing Babylon down. Now, God pictured that as, as, as terrible descriptions of what he's going to do to Babylon. And yet, um, those descriptions are thought to be glorious in our society, the culture we live in. Someone's nakedness is shown, their, their veil is ripped off, their, their uh, thigh is showing, their skirt is lifted, and um, they're paid money to expose themselves that way. Well, be that as it may, let's move on. Uh, verse 4, it's interesting that right in the middle of talking about Babylon's going to fall, the statement is made that the Lord is our Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Uh, God's going to bring Babylon to shame, but then he says the Lord is, is our Redeemer. He proclaims the Lord of hosts is the one in power. Now, verses 5 to 7, Babylon will no longer be called the Lady of the Kingdoms, a statement of her power, that Babylon had become the Lady of the Kingdoms because God had allowed that to happen. And so notice in verse 5, Set in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the Lady of the Kingdoms. I will anger, I was angry with my people and I profaned my inheritance. In other words, you were called the lady of the kingdoms because you were able to take, take Judah. You, uh, and this is yet future, but you will be allowed to take Judah and other nations. But you only did that because I allowed that. So I'm learning again, the nations are a tool and an instrument. Their nations are a tool and an instrument. Um, and notice that verse 7, you had said, I'll be a lady forever. They thought their, their power was endless, and we have ultimate power as a nation, and we're, we're, we're powerful. And uh, no, you're not going to be a lady of the kingdom for very long. Um, now, to start at verse 8, widowhood is going to come up on Babylon. Widowhood is going to come up on Babylon. Babylon had boasted of her security. She dwells securely, who says in her heart, I am, and there is none else beside me. I shall not set as a widow, nor shall I know the loss of children. Uh, there seemed to be associated with widowhood and losing children uh, some degree of weakness. But that's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to be like a widow. I'm not going to be like one who's lost their children. I'm not going to be one that weeps, Babylon is saying. And um, we are secure. But these two things, verse 9, will come up on you. The loss of children and widowhood. I'm going to make you a widow and I'm going to make you lose your children. Not literally, because she's not a person. But widowhood's going to come up on Babylon. Now, verses 10 and 11, it's Babylon's pride that's going to bring her down. Look at verse 10. Uh, For you have trusted in your wickedness and you have said, no one sees me. In other words, you do wickedness, you bow down before your idols, and you think no one knows what's going on, and your wisdom and your knowledge have warped you. That's an interesting phrase, led you astray, the footnote will say. Has your wisdom warped you? It's a good question, isn't it? I think wisdom has warped some people. Their wisdom, their own wisdom, have warped them. Uh, I'm reading from the New King James. Yours may read different. Now, let's drop down to verse 12. In other words, their pride is what brought them down. Uh, now, verse 12 through 15, to bring this, to, this section to a close, the pagan practice is not going to help deliver them. Uh, 
Notice your, their enchantments and their sorceries mentioned at verse 12. Uh, in which you have labored from your youth, perhaps you will uh, be able to profit. Perhaps you will prevail. Uh, you have wearied the multitude of your counsels, uh, the astrologers and the uh, prognosticators and the stargazers. In other words, you tried all of these pagan practices and you consulted with your, your, all your wizards and et cetera, et cetera. You've done all of that. And behold, they shall be a stubble, verse 14, and the fire shall burn them. In other words, when God's done with Babylon, he's going to destroy the, the people and all the things they're in. And uh, your pagan practices and all of your astrologers, they're not going to help you at all. So what's the point? I'm not expecting us to go back and remember every uh, one of these six details, but that Babylon's going to be brought down. I'm going to bring her to shame, God said. When I'm done with Babylon, I'm going to be done with Babylon. Let me remind you again, I know you've heard this before, but this was prophesied before Babylon ever came to power. They're not even in power yet, and God's, God's talking about taking them down. And so God's not saying, well, let's see how she does. Let's see if she can. Now, God knows what they're going to do. And so he's foretelling they're going to rise in power. They're going to be so arrogant. They're going to boast in their own power, and I'm going to bring them down. And I'm going to bring them down by Cyrus. And uh, he's going to be the one to do that. All right. Uh, we've got about five minutes, so let's see if we can get through chapter 48. There are three things here. Israel's need for deliverance was brought upon herself. And the first thing is Israel will be refined but not cut off. Now let's focus on this. We only have 22 verses. I believe we can make this. Um, that, first of all, Israel had called upon God but not in truth. Look at verse, verse 1. You make mention of God. I'm starting in the middle of the verse. You make mention of the God of Israel but not in truth or righteousness. In other words, not with a whole heart. They call upon God but it's not with the, the whole heart. Being, they're not sincere in that. That's verses 1 and 2. Verses 3 to 5, God proved who he was, and yet Israel was obstinate. How did God prove who he was? Here's the third of the areas you're looking for on page 1 of your handout, prophecy and fulfillment. Here we go. I have declared the former things from the beginning. That's prophecy and fulfillment. They went forth from my mouth, and I caused you to hear it, and suddenly I did them. There's the fulfillment. And they... And they came to pass, because I knew you were obstinate. In other words, I proved who I was, I prophesied and I fulfilled it. That proves that I am the one true God, and yet you were still stubborn. And uh, you brought this on yourself. Now, look at verse 6 to 8. God is just now telling them. I'm going to paraphrase this section in interest of time. Look at verse 6. You're going to hear a new theme. The new thing is that Cyrus is the one that's going, that Babylon's going to fall and Cyrus is going to be the one to deliver. He just told him that, chapter 44 and 45. That's the new thing, I think. And I'm just now telling you this. So why didn't I tell this like hundreds of years before, which God could have done? Because you would have thought, I've known it all along. That's why I'm just now telling you, this close, 150 years before. <laughs> that's why I waited this close to tell you. If I'd have told you 500 or 1,000 years before, you'd have said, I've known it all along. And that's because of their being obstinate. Now, verse uh, 9 through 11, God's going to cut Israel off. Notice he said, I will defer my anger so that I, um, or he's not going to cut them off, that he's going to ref refine them but not cut them off, so that I will not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you but not as silver. What's his point? I'm going to send you into Babylonian captivity. Oh, you're going to be punished, and it's like being refined. But I'm not going to utterly destroy you. I'm not going to completely obliterate the nation. It's not going to be gone. There's going to be a remnant come back. That's the point. It's going to come back. So Israel's going to be refined, but not destroyed and not cut off. There's hope. There's hope. Now then, God plans to overthrow Babylon 12 to 16. God is eternal, verses 12 and 13. He is the creator. Look at verse 12, that I am he, I am the first and the last. That's an eternal, an affirmation of the eternal nature of God. Now, verse 14 and 15 and 16, the Lord's going to do his pleasure. Now, notice at verse 14, that he shall do his pleasure on Babylon. Now, look at verse 15. I, even I have spoken, yet I have called him. I take that to be uh, Cyrus and have brought him and his way will prosper. 
In other words, it looks like Cyrus is rising in power and then he, he overtakes and causes Babylon to fall because I let him do it. Remember God said in chapter 45, I grabbed his right hand and I, I led him about. And so that's the point. Now let's get this last section right here. 17 to 22, God would deliver Israel, though deliverance should not have been necessary. Now that's interesting. It's, that, that is some assurance and a rebuke at the same time, which they needed both. Now look at verse 17. Um, yes, yeah, 17. The Lord says, the Lord, your Redeemer, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. In other words, um, I told you, and I led you, and I told you the way you should go. I taught you in the way that you should go. I taught you in the right direction. But, look at verse 18. You might underline verse 18. Oh, that you had heeded my commandment. You just didn't listen. Now, verse 19, 18 and 19. If you had listened, there would have been peace. There would have been safety. Notice the word peace. Would have been like a river. Uh, you would, your descendants would be like the sand. Nor would your name have been cut off nor destroyed from before me. In other words, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. In other words, I taught you, led you in the right direction. If you would have just listened to me, we wouldn't be dealing with captivity. You wouldn't be going into captivity. We wouldn't be worrying about Babylon. Now, let's get 20 and 21. Deliverance from Babylon is for a people that he cared for. Go forth from Babylon, he said. Flee from the Chaldeans with the voice of singing. Even though he's rebuked them, he tells them when the time comes, I want you to go forth from Babylon. I want you to go forth from the Chaldeans and go forth with singing. And the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. That's the remnant returning. And they do not thirst when he, uh, when he led them through the desert. In other words, verse 21 talks about what God did in the wilderness and how he split the rock and brought water from the rock. Uh, and he fed them in the wilderness, etc. In other words, these are the same people I cared for in the wilderness. I'm going to bring them out of captivity. I'm caring for my nation through whom the Messiah is going to come. Now he ends on this note, and this is interesting because we're about to shift gears. Completely next week, we're going to another subject. We're going to be talking about the Messiah. He ends on this note, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. That's interesting. Deliverance from Babylonian captivity is what 40 to 48 is all about. He ends that section. One of the last things he said is, you wouldn't, be worried, you, you wouldn't even have to worry about captivity if you'd lived right, if you'd done right, if you'd behaved, but you didn't do it. But the time's coming, you're going to come out of captivity, and I want you to come out, and I'll deliver you. There is no peace for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. We're going to end on that note. We're going to shift gears next time. We're going to talk about the Messiah. So get ready next time to be looking for messianic passages over and over and over and over. And we're going to do that for several chapters now, starting in chapter 49.